Who's excited? I am so giddy. I squealed literally when Adrienne Marie Brown came onto the screen right before we opened this up to you all. Welcome. I know you're excited. We're all having a fan club moment. <laughs> the amazing author, activist, educator, Adrienne Marie Brown is in the house. There are over 500 of you who signed up for this event today. You're hungry to be in community, to be inspired. And that's what's gonna happen. We've got social workers, we've got educators, we've got concerned citizens. We've got folks who wanna be fully human. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Amanda Moore McBride. I serve as Dean of the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. And we're delighted to be in our sixth season of our Catalyst for Social Justice series. And I have to say, <laughs> At GSSW, we have waited to sit at Adrian's feet for several years. In fact, in the months, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, when our campus shut down, our communities shut down, we went to virtual spaces and we used Emergent Strategy, Adrian's incredible book, to inform how we as a school could approach this chaos how we could approach our understanding of what we were experiencing in a way that didn't just meant we lived it, but how could we learn from it to create more just institutions. I'm so delighted that Adrienne's with us here today. As we approach this conversation with them, I invite you to join me in committing to change, to changing yourselves, the organizations that you work with, the institutions that you work within. Individuals make up those collectives. And so the change starts with us. We at the School of Social Work approach social change fueled by our commitment to act toward justice for the original peoples who inhabited the lands upon which the founders of the University of Denver stole to act toward justice for those in our society who are marginalized, killed, and erased by white supremacy and patriarchy. Leading today's conversation for us is GSSW professor Markeisha Lawrence Scott. Professor Scott herself is an author, an activist, and an educator. She's also a spiritual guide for us at the school always reminding us of our larger purpose as academics, as well as our higher purpose as humans on this planet. Her work to advance justice focuses on core societal institutions such as religious congregations and how they can be catalysts for social change, especially for our youth. We are honored to have Professor Scott on the faculty and in conversation with us today. Professor Scott, are you ready? Let's do this. I am ready indeed. Thank you for that introduction, Dean McBride. Um, and I am honored and excited to have our keynote speaker and great thought leader, great spiritual guide, um, Adrian Marie Brown here with us today for this Catalyst series for social justice. Um, dreams do come true. <laughs> um, so while this is Adrian's first time speaking with us, Adrian is not a stranger to the GSSW community. Many of our faculty and staff and students read and follow Adrian's work and use it as a guide. Um, in fact, our Change for a Theory uh, for Practice course that I teach, um, along with some of my other amazing colleagues, um, where we discuss Adrian's Emergent Strategies Framework as we are teaching our social work students about the different approaches to engaging change in community and organizations. Um, so in addition to being a great challenger um, to our thinking and our practice, um, many of us um, on this webinar are probably aware of some of the work that Adrian has done, but I will list it um, just um, if you're looking for some new information. Um, and Adrian is the writer in residence in the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute the author of five solo books, Grievers, which is the first novella in a trilogy on the Black Dime imprint, 
holding change the way of emergent strategy facilitation and mediation. We will not cancel us and other dreams of transform transformative justice, excuse me. Pleasure activism, the politics of feeling good, emergent strategy, shaping change, changing worlds, and co-author of two books, Octavius Brood, Science Fiction for Social Justice Movements and How to Get Stupid White Men Out of Office. Um, Adrian is also the co-host of How to Survive the End of the World, Octavius Parables, and Emergent Strategy Podcasts. Um, Adrian is rooted in Detroit and is here today to share their great work with us. So there will be time for um, questions to be typed into the Q&A at the second part of the webinar. Um, so, but while you prepare your thoughts and questions for Adrian, I encourage you to center yourself to prepare yourself for listening, learning, and engaging the knowledge that will be presented to us today. So let's just take a moment and take just three deep breaths. And without further delay, everyone please receive Adrian Marie Brown to the space for today's keynote address. Adrian. Hello, 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 everyone. Um, let's see. I think you can see and hear me. Um, I'm sending you all my love. Thank you so much for the gracious, sweet, generous, kind welcome. Thank you for making space to listen uh, to what I have to offer today. Um, my approach, I keep dancing with like, well, how to do keynote, what to do with keynote um, that Oh, creates more openings so that it's not just like, I have all the wisdom and you need all the wisdom, um, but really to create a conversation where I can share with you what I am learning um, with the caveat that I'm always learning. <laughs> and so what I'm learning is always changing. And um, it's really powerful to, to orient your life around pleasure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna offer you all some thoughts on how that came to happen for me and where I think it intersects with issues that are happening today. And then I wanna move into conversation and hear your questions. So um, I have notes and I will go through them and we'll see what happens. So um, first of all, I wanna acknowledge you all. Um, you know, when I think of the School of Social Work, anytime I'm like, thank God, thank God, thank God you exist. I think social workers often are the people who understood before anyone else that we all need helpers. We all need people to take our hands and to catch us when the storm is overwhelming. And I know of many people in my life whose lives have been saved by the timely intervention of someone who um, was able to listen from the heart and move from the heart and help them to navigate systems that are really inhumane. Um, so I wanna say thank you. Thank you for turning and saying, this will be my path. And inside of that path, my work is to really imbue you with a, a hunger for justice and um, to help you understand that you are a front line for abolition, you are a front line for uh, liberation, you're a front line for excellent lives and excellent um, work, you know, like what we get to do with, with the sacred gift that we've been given. And this is a complicated moment in history, um, although I, I'm starting to suspect they all are. <laughs> it's just like how aware you are of what's happening, but it feels like a really complicated, fast moving moment in history where it's quite possible that a lot of people are going to fall through the cracks, are falling through the cracks. And there's a lot of crisis, there's a lot of overwhelm. And inside of that, it's like, how do we talk about pleasure? What does it mean to lean into that part of ourselves that wants to feel joy? And I'm glad that you're bringing your attention to it. And the first part of it, uh, this is what I know for sure, is when we tune into ourselves, we can tell that we're wired for more than just suffering. And that is our nature. Like, it's not my opinion. <laughs> it's not something that I'm just like, just trust me. I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's something that 
all kinds of scholarship has gone into understanding what our bodies are wired for and how our brains work in relationship to each other. And everything that we can see is that we are a deeply relational species that needs each other and that responds to yes, that responds to positive interactions. If you've been around babies, you know this. Uh, two very close friends of mine just had babies and so I've gotten to be in that newborn energy where it's all just like sensation and being held and being cared for and being changed and being fed. And I think that that aspect of ourselves never actually goes anywhere. Like the part of ourselves that needs really tender loving care, that inner child stays there. And as we go through trauma and as we go through the things that disconnect us from wanting to feel and being able to feel, that inner child is always still there waiting, waiting. And so today I'm both speaking to you as your adult self that's out in the world making change. And I also wanna speak directly to the part of you that is perpetually young, perpetually curious, perpetually adaptive. And the part of you that had an original idea of what you were gonna be doing with your life and how it was gonna feel. Um, I wanna unlock that part and, and give it more space to shape what you're doing now. So, um, First of all, what is pleasure activism? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, I always have the book around with me. And um, when I came out with this book and I started talking to people about it, it was amazing to me how, how people would go to the wildest places, you know, like pleasure activism is all about like a sex dungeon type thing. And I was like, well, you know, if that's your thing, you know, you should build a dungeon. But for many of us, there's other things that, that bring us pleasure. Um, and it can be both and it's sexual, it can be drug related, but in most of us, it's, it's all of our lives. There's poetry, there's food, there's dance, there's music, there's being around children, there's so many things. And so when I talk of pleasure, I'm really talking about happiness, satisfaction, and contentment. And what does it mean to be able to experience those things in a world that has been structurally developed to deny that to the majority of people who live in it? Um, because there's capitalism. <laughs> and I'm never gonna hold back on talking about capitalism, but the economic system that we're in, which is actually relatively short-lived in the long history of humans. Um, we had a lot, a lot of time as humans of living in cooperative, collective uh, economic conditions where we really took care of each other and we saw things in relationship and where we understood our relationship to the natural world to be the way that we were gonna get fed, the way that we were gonna get community. But capitalism makes us instead compete, compete, compete to accumulate endless amounts of goods um, that we may or may not need, endless amounts of money that correlates to gold somewhere maybe, um, endless amounts of excess at the expense of the earth and each other. So, ha, huh, right, how do we deal with living inside this economic system and still feeling satisfaction and contentment? You might be on to me already, but part of it is that we have to change our economy. <laughs> so we can talk about that and the activism piece comes in here because it's really how do we take responsibility for the world that we live in and all of the structures which are interconnected and which uphold a worldview that some of us deserve pleasure and others don't. And I'm going to read to you just the page that is what is pleasure activism because I think there's a lot of clarity in there um, around all the different sides of it. So Pleasure is the feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. Activism consists of efforts to promote, impede, or direct social, political, economic, or environmental reform or stasis with a desire to make improvements in society. Pleasure activism is the work we do to reclaim our whole, happy, and satisfiable selves from the, from the impacts, delusions, and limitations of oppression and or supremacy. Pleasure activism asserts that we all need and deserve pleasure and that our social structures must reflect this. In this moment, we must prioritize the pleasure of those most impacted by oppression. Pleasure activists seek to understand and learn from the politics and power dynamics inside of everything that makes us feel good. 
This includes sex and the erotic, drugs, fashion, humor, passion work, connection, reading, cooking or eating, music and other arts, and so much more. Pleasure activists believe that by tapping into the potential goodness in each of us, we can generate justice and liberation, growing a healing abundance where we have been socialized to believe only scarcity exists. Pleasure activism acts from an analysis that pleasure is natural, safe, and liberated, a natural, safe, and liberated part of life, and that we can offer each other tools and education to make sure sex, desire, drugs, connection, and other pleasures aren't life-threatening or harming, but life-enriching. Pleasure activism includes work and life lived in the realms of satisfaction, joy, and erotic aliveness that bring about social and political change. Ultimately, pleasure activism is us learning how to make justice and liberation the most pleasurable experiences we can have on this planet. So I think it's a good idea. <laughs> I still think it's a good idea. And I've really been growing community for the past few years of people who are aligned with it in one way or another. And I wanna take a moment and sort of step back and say, why was this book needed? And in order to say why I think this book was needed, I have to step back even further because the person who inspired this book was a writer named Audre Lorde. Hopefully you know Audre Lorde, you love her work already, you've read all of it. But if you haven't, she was a writer and an organizer um, and her writing was poetry and essays. And she, she was an activist in the most beautiful way. She was a feminist, she was a lesbian and she left us a lot of gifts. And one of them is this eight page essay called The Uses of the Erotic as Power. And she wrote it, it was published in August of 1978. I was born in September of 1978 and I always love the idea that she, when she was writing this, before I was born, the conditions that were that made it necessary to articulate this were already in place. And the understanding of how we could get through this was also already in place. So that text is a river that flows through this book. And it's really deeply related to the Black experience. So I want to share that I know deeply that the Black experience is not a monolithic experience. Some of us have ancestors who were enslaved here. Some of us have immigration stories of choice. Some of us have had to escape where we were and this was the only choice. And this is true quite as, as is kept, not just of Black lineages, but of almost every lineage. <laughs> there's um, the story that gets told of this country and then there's what actually happened, which often involves running and war and displacement and confusion and genocide and there's been so much violence that we have done to each other and so much moving about and, and trying to find a place where we can be safe and belong. And the, the end result of that is that very, very few of us actually have a clear line back to our origins, right? Uh, the indigenous peoples of, uh, or aboriginal peoples, depending on where you are, of the landscapes that we live in. There's a, there are people who actually can trace their way all the way back along their lineage to the original music, the original songs, the original instructions. But a lot of us end up walking around longing for a mother tongue that we wouldn't even recognize if we heard it. And maybe we were raised by kings and queens, but most likely from an anti-monarchial analysis, most of us were from workers, <laughs> all kinds of different workers. And we've been working for generations. And some of us were raised to be patriotic to this nation or to others. We were told if we worked hard enough um, and if we were just like constantly working that we could make it. And others were told never to trust anything that this country tells us to seek our liberation by other means, by any means. Fear, there's all this distinction in the human experience and particularly in the black experience and then there are these common threads that tie us together. We living inside of capitalism have had to normalize the labor of martyrdom. The people that I run with, the people that I love and call community, all of us have been overworked and underpaid at least once in our lives. M many of us more than that. 
especially if we're in caregiving roles, especially if we are in the roles that are associated with the feminine, right? The mothering, the nursing, the caregiving, the grandmothering, like the catching the children. You know, I, my grandmother had seven children, but maybe raised a thousand, <laughs> you know? There's those stories of people who have been un, undervalued the contribution has been undervalued. The body, the black body, the woman body, the queer body, the trans body has been undervalued such that people have not given us care, stability, ease, health, not seen us as leaders, right? It's common. Many of us share a history of trauma in the place where we most want and need pleasure. And that includes our sexual harm histories in the forms of molestation, assault, harassment, rape, or just silencing our sexual instincts, making us feel ashamed of who we are and what we feel. Many of us have stories of reproductive grief and fear that can keep us from really softening into and opening into the possibilities of pleasure in the embodied experience. Many of us need help and permission and guidance to see our bodies as a site of pleasure and joy and satisfaction, contentment, ease, rest, peace. Specifically, those on this call are mostly people who are expected to hold others somehow, even if we haven't landed for ourselves how to access pleasure consistently. And I find that this has been the case for my life. <laughs> from very early on, people are like, yeah, how do we do this? And, I don't know. Um, but I will help you. <laughs> I will help you. We, we're the people who say, yes, I will help you. And our pleasure really matters. Um, the energy that we are cultivating within ourselves actually matters. It matters to the people that we're showing up for and that we're seeking to hold. It matters that we have a faith in our own pleasure and a faith in our own satisfiability. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but I want to say that I wrote pleasure activism for people like myself and people like y'all. I'm smart and hardworking and I show up to work and I get things done. And like many of us, I was very young when leadership opportunities um, started showing up, <laughs> which I also, I always say opportunities kind of with the quote marks because it's often an unveiled invitation to be an undervalued space of extreme labor. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, do I wanna be the leader? But I did that labor and I took on those roles and I was eagerly seeking belonging and love and, and like, not just at the surface level, but I, the kind of belonging and love that I believe were stolen from me at an ancestral level. Um, I believe that all of our peoples, all human beings belong to the land. We belong to specific land, we belong to the whole earth. And I think that when we are stolen or displaced, pushed off of our land, when it is made uninhabitable to us, um, I think that we are, we're meant to know that land. And so we end up searching high and low and in and out for that tether, that sense of unconditional belonging that comes from a land that knows your name. I didn't belong to any of the worlds that I grew up in. I had an army dad. We moved every two to three years. So I was on a base here, on a base there. It all looked the same. I didn't belong to the sleeping world, which America dreams its way through egregious, egregious injustices. I didn't belong even to the revolutionary queer black spaces. I mean, the revolutionary black spaces that I tried to initially enter because I was queer and quirky and men didn't quite know what to do with me if I wouldn't respect the myth of their superiority or sleep with them. And then I didn't belong in other places because I had this black queer feminist worldview that was the liberating thought process that fit my mind and my heart, um, but made other people feel so challenged. And I wanna mention there's a gender abolitionist activist named Alok who I follow online and have been around and in conversations with, who I absolutely adore uh, the, the thinking that they're doing. But one of the ideas that they put out because uh, people call them non-binary and they were like, you know, non-binary doesn't even do it because it's an expression of absence. And I, I see my identity as a presence. And I would rather say that my identity was infinite. And I really love that because I'm like, right, how do all these infinite beings, which all of us are, we all have the full capacity of infinite beinghood. How do we fit in? How do we find community 
in places that want us to leave part of ourselves at the door? How can we feel pleasure if we're leaving part of ourselves at the door? Right? So I floated around busting my butt for the movement and repressing my need for healing and for health and for a living wage and for respect and for consideration and for sleep. I confused numbing myself and escaping for pleasure. And I confused being drunk or high or super sexual or binge eating and living a deeply foggy life for pleasure. So if we were all in a room together, I would ask you if you know what I mean. I would ask if you two have been a leader in your household or in your community or in your organization or church or mosque or temple or network or state or nation. And if you've realized at some point that you couldn't feel anymore and that you were scrolling through your life, that you were the most accountable person in the room and that you were tired. So that brings us back to Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde knew this feeling and she wrote the uses of the erotic as power because she recognized that in order to bring us out of the fog into the deep presence, we actually had to awaken the erotic within ourselves. And I'm gonna read just a little bit from her because she deserves it every time. We have been raised to fear the yes within ourselves, our deepest cravings. But once recognized, those which do not enhance our future lose their power and can be altered. The fear of our desires keeps them suspect and indiscriminately powerful for to suppress any truth is to give it strength beyond endurance. The fear that we cannot grow beyond whatever distortions we may find within ourselves keeps us docile and loyal and obedient, externally defined. It leads us to accept many facets of our own oppression. When we live outside ourselves, and by that I mean on external directives only, rather than from our internal knowledge and needs, when we live away from those erotic guides from within ourselves, then our lives are limited by external and alien forms, and we conform to the needs of a structure that is not based on human need, let alone in individuals. But when we begin to live from within outward, in touch with the power of the erotic within ourselves and allowing that power to inform and illuminate our actions upon the world around us, then we begin to be responsible to ourselves in the deepest sense. For as we begin to recognize our deepest feelings, we begin to give up of necessity being satisfied with suffering and self-negation and with the numbness, which so often seems like their only alternative in our society. Our acts against oppression become integral with self, motivated and empowered from within. In touch with the erotic, I become less willing to accept powerlessness or those other supplied states of being which are not native to me, such as resignation, despair, self-effacement, depression, self-denial. Every time I read this, it gives me chills and it gives me direction. Reading Audre Lorde and looking at my own life, I had an awakening that I'm not constructed for suffering. Suffering is, right? Suffering is a necessary component of life. You know, like I've been reading my Buddhist text and I understand that there is a condition of coming into the world and dying. There is a condition of natural and unnatural disaster. There is a condition of, of struggle that is a part of being human so far. And it's part of what shapes us, part of what brings depth to our life, part of what makes us an adult, a grown up, able to make choices because we know the consequences. They're suffering, but it should be balanced. And it's not what we're built for. It's not what we're made to do. We're made to do something else. I know that I am not a miraculous being meant to toil to the bone for other people's imaginations, which are based on me shrinking and serving them. And if you've heard me ever speak about visionary fiction or radical imagination, part of what I, I believe to be true is that we are in an imagination battle where we're up against people who imagine that whiteness and masculinity and able-bodiedness and 
straight bodiedness, that all of these ways of being were somehow supreme to other ways of being. And in that imagining, they've created a pathway to practice inside of, and that pathway required my subjugation, the subjugation of my ancestors, subjugation of my queerness and my magic. And I know that, that that's not the way that we're meant to be in this world. I also know that I'm not meant to give continuously of my gifts and talents where there is no love coming back to me, where there's no love available in the space. Uh, Nina Simone said that if there's no love at the table, <laughs> you know, we got to get out of here. It's self-denial. So I began to study in earnest. I started writing and thinking and reading and studying. I read Audre Lorde. I read Tony K. Bambara. I read Lucille Clifton. I went back. I went forward. I was trying to understand it all. And I started writing a column for a bitch magazine. It was called The Pleasure Dome. And I started documenting and um, pontificating on what I was coming to understand. I wrote about getting comfortable in my naked skin, looking at myself, learning to desire myself, examining any fantasy in which a thin, white, or able body was more desirable than mine. Now it actually feels preposterous to me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, bodies are all amazing. They're all hot, they're all flesh and nerves and magic. But that took work. It took work to get there. And I had to learn what it meant to be in consent to set and hold boundaries, to negotiate the touch I wanted, the sex I wanted. I wrote about learning that I could ejaculate and learning about sex toys and pornography and period sex. And I was like, this is what sex education should actually be based around is how outstanding the human body is and how there's all these differences and none of them are wrong. None of them are dysfunctions, they're just distinctions. And inside those distinctions, we can have a magnificent, time in our bodies, our whole lives. I also wrote about weed and ecstasy and mushrooms and healing and wholeness and Beyonce <laughs> and gratitude and non-monogamy and liberated relationships. When I reached the edges of what I had practiced and what I knew for sure, I reached out to other people and I wove in their knowledge and that covered sex work and burlesque pole dancing and humor you know I think I'm funny but not like comedian level funny <laughs> you know just like conversationally and I, I wanted to hear from people who really work with the medicine of humor really work with the medicine of fashion I wanted to talk to people who experience pleasure through parenting um, pleasure over the age of 60 pleasure with cancer there's so much that I didn't get to include. I had interviewed all these different people or set up interviews with all these people in the disability justice world and those interviews didn't come through. I feel like that's a whole other book <laughs> that still wants to be written and I'm trying to figure it out. And I do have a book in the work um, being co-edited by two thick black femme women who are writing about kink for black feminists <laughs> because I think that that's important and we need to explore it. And I also really wanna dive deeper into my non-sexual pleasures of food and movement. I look to the writing of Bryant Thomas Terry, um, who is an incredible vegan chef who keeps putting out book after book about the pleasures of being in healthy relationship to the lineage of food. So I wanted to share that, like what all happens inside of pleasure activism and the journey of it, because sometimes I think people get like stuck in just the phrase and not moving into deeply what it is. I wanna share with you the principles and then we'll wrap up and we can start to move ourselves into a Q&A space. So be thinking about what your questions are. But I love principles. I love sort of these guideposts that help you move through complex ideas. And these are the principles of pleasure activism. One, what you pay attention to grows. This principle will be familiar for those of you who've read Emergent Strategy. Actually, all of the emergent strategy principles also apply here, but tune in to happiness and what satisfies you, what brings you joy. I would add that during this pandemic, <laughs> when it's felt like, where can I find joy? I can't even get body work. I can't travel. I can't go swim. Like how? Um, it's been really important to also notice in a given day, what are the things I can do in my body rather than focusing on what are the things I can't do? 
because the things I can't do, that list can get so long, but the things I can do are actually quite satisfying still. So what you pay attention to grows. Two, we become what we practice. We become what we practice. I learned this through studying somatics, which is the study of the body in its wholeness and really the study of learning to feel, to embody again. In his book, The Leadership Dojo, Richard Strozzi Heckler shares that 300 repetitions produce a body memory and 3000 repetitions create embodiment. So just look at your own life. What were you told to practice from a very young age? It might be something as simple as stop crying, right? Or I'll give you something to cry about. And how many times have you then practiced repressing your tears because you were in the company of others or because you were scared that if you started crying, you would never stop or because it didn't feel appropriate to cry in public or something else? How many times have you practiced that? And what is the result of that in terms of being able to embody your sadness or your anger or your fear? What would you have to practice in order to let that part awaken again? And maybe I'll say this here, we don't practice to feel good. We practice to feel more. That's one of the key aspects of somatics particularly, but of also learning to feel again in the body. And I even say that for pleasure activism, it's not just about being able to feel good, right? The trick to being able to feel good is you're able to feel everything. And within all of that feeling, you're able to practice your way towards consistently moving in the direction that gives you pleasure. So we become what we practice. Three, yes is the way. Yes is the way. When it was time for me to move, when it was time to leave my last job, pick up a meditation practice, swim, eat healthier, I knew because it gave me pleasure when I made and lived into the decision. Now I'm letting that guide my choices for how I organize and for what I aim to do with all of my work. I look for pleasure in the processes of my existence and the states of my being. Yes is the future. When I feel pleasure, I know I'm on the right track. Puerto Rican pleasure elder Idalis Malave shared with me that her pleasure principle is, if it pleases me, I will which ties into the next one, the fourth one from my woe, Jody. When I'm happy, it is good for the world. And I'll say this because people are like, what? Isn't that individualistic? But actually it's about our interdependence. We are a fractal structure. Human beings are fractal interconnected dynamic structure. One could actually argue, and, and my friend Alexis Pauline Gums does, we're not individuals. My friend Gopal says the smallest unit is the relationship. We are always in relationship to others, even though we feel the singularity of our experience. So when we are in that fractal interconnected space, actually being able to turn up our authentic joy, not the grandstanding performative, doing it for the gram, like everything is great, but the real deep embodied, like down in the center of me, it is good. People ask me how I'm doing and I can say, I'm good. And I mean that, that level of fractal practice that when it's good for me, it's good for the world. When I'm happy, it's good for the world. Five, I think <laughs> the deepest pleasure comes from riding the line between commitment and detachment. Commitment and detachment. Commit yourself fully to the process, to the journey, to bringing the best you can bring. Detach yourself from ego and outcomes, right? You're not in control of the outcome. You are in control of what you put into it. Six, make justice and liberation feel good. I was a facilitator for 25 years before I started moving into writing this work. And one of the things I've learned in all that time of holding space and holding movement and holding people and change processes is that we wanna create spaces that people want to be in spaces that feel compelling to be in. There's a pleasure that comes from doing work that is worthwhile, that is meaningful, that is impactful, that is actually having an impact. Um, it's really demoralizing to say you're serving a community that never experiences feeling served, right? How do you actually do work that is satisfying and the pleasure comes from it being satisfying? How do we make it feel good? How do we celebrate each other, right? Even if it's the small things, happy birthday, yeah, you finally divorced her, whatever it is, right? 
Seven, your no makes the way for your yes. Boundaries create the container within which your yes is authentic. Being able to say no makes yes a choice. So whatever you're doing right now, however you're listening to me, bring to mind something right now in your life, you know what it is that you need to say no to. You're like, I need to say no to this thing or this person or this scheduled whatever. I know I need to say no. My body is telling me I need to say no. I want you to just practice it. Take a moment and practice it. Remember, no is a complete sentence, right? So just imagine the, the request, the question coming into you. Can you overextend yourself for me? No. And just think about what you make room for with that no. Maybe it's a bath or a little bit more rest or a weekend at home, being able to be present with your partner. Just notice, oh, what am I creating more space for? Your no makes the way for your yes. The final principle, moderation is key. The idea is not to be in a heady state of ecstasy at all times, but rather to learn how to sense when something is good for you, to be able to feel what enough is. Related to this, pleasure is not money. You may have guessed it from my anti-capitalist screed earlier, but pleasure is not even related to money, not in a positive way. Having the resources to buy unlimited amounts of pleasure leads to excess, and excess actually destroys the spiritual experience of pleasure. Right. So those are the principles. I want to flag just because I'm speaking to y'all as an institution that there's another pleasure, a shadow pleasure we don't always want to talk about, which is our, the pleasure we derive from punishing each other. And we can be in communities where we're forming our relationships by making fun of each other, tearing each other down, gossiping about each other, um, where we find it very difficult to be happy for each other's achievements. And that's not an accident. <laughs> we're actually inside of structures that maintain power by keeping us um, working against each other rather than actually building any kind of solidarity with each other. So one of the things I wonder is if we understand that our capacity to meet, mistreat each other such is a sign of that same colonial power that originally disconnected us from our bodies and our land and our power still at work, right? So it shows up in a lot of ways. Like people expect us to mammy and martyr and toil without celebration or attention and then punish each other when things go wrong. And if we start to shine and our magic and our power show anyway, we move to tear each other down, move to tear each other apart. I wanna see what it feels like for institutions to commit themselves to relinquishing gossip culture, relinquishing punish it, punishment culture, punitive culture, starting to move towards being abolitionist even at, at the scale of relationship that's happening in the institution. There is actually a really beautiful pleasure that comes from being in right relationships and right relationships include conflict, right? Being able to actually say, I'm upset with you or I need a boundary with you, right? Because we don't buy, maybe we're astrological opposites, who knows what it is, but being able to actually set the boundaries or ask for the process you need to resolve the conflict, figure it out so that we can actually move that shadow pleasure of punishing each other off of our pleasure plate, off of our table, right? And if you need support around that, I always recommend the book, Fumbling Towards Repair, Fumbling Towards Repair by Shira Hassan and Miriam Kaba, because I really believe there's something that we need to learn at a collective level um, that relinquishes the policing of each other, relinquishes the hurting of each other. I believe it's our inner work to reclaim our inherent right to pleasure, to awaken the wiring for delight and satisfaction that exist in each of us. But I also believe there is collective and perhaps almost a congregational work to do, to be accountable for celebrating each other and protecting each other. Maybe it's Sangha work, right? Like whatever you wanna call that circle of people who are building something to believe in together. I think we need to ask ourselves all the time, am I satisfiable? Are we satisfiable? Whose satisfaction is served when we tear down our own, when we pull each other apart, when we expect labor without offering gratitude? 
I want us to continue to work hard for that which is ours to do. Our generation, I believe, is here to defund the police, to reclaim sovereignty over our reproduction, to make racism past tense, to make sure that the land actually moves back into the right hands, the ownership, the relationship of those who can listen to it and love it and protect it. I believe ours is the, the maybe the last generation to repress all of these feelings and the first generation to learn how to wield them powerfully with each other. I believe our generation is here to transform how we understand justice, which means we have a lot to do. And I want us to work knowing that we can have each other's back and love each other and foment pleasure together, even when we fail, <laughs> even when we win, right? Even as we're learning, even as we're changing. I will say, and I invite you all to join me in this, that I don't think we need to wait for permission from anyone who doesn't love us to create the changes that we need to create. I am reclaiming the love and the pleasure that's due to me every day with a million small decisions. I believe we are reclaiming it at the scale of our movements to the level of justice. And I see us giving it to each other more and more, turning to each other to say, are we satisfiable? And are we satisfied? I don't think we'll be satisfied until we've completely transformed our economic structure and until we've completely transformed our relationship to the planet. But I believe that starts with each of our small behaviors and understanding that our bodies are earth. Our bodies are the earth that we've each been given to care for, to cultivate, to grow. So I think that we're responsible for redistributing belonging, joy, and satisfaction to each other through pleasure activism in every possible way. Thank you so much. Hi, Markeisha. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, wow, you have given us many great challenges <laughs> um, to think about. Um, and some of the questions have already um, begun to come into the Q&A, so feel free to do that. Um, and I will um, try to merge some of them together. I see a couple okay. of through lines that are already starting to- um, I trust you, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Okay, so you have um, all of your, you know, work and thoughts are completely antithetical to what many of us have been, cre you know, created and yeah. uh, curated, <laughs> right? Like, as, but as you said, none of that is on purpose, right? And so this is um, uh, uh, something that we're all um, constantly up against, and the, you know, the scam is layered. <laughs> nice. um, so. With all of that, you know, this concept of pleasure is new to us and yeah. um, in helping those on the webinar, including myself, um, we, we need help of where to start. Uh -huh. So when we think um, just for <laughs> yourself, um, what practices and or rituals do you find most sacred for yourself in your, in your own work? I love this question. You know, the easiest thing that you can do every single day and you can do it many, many times a day is actually stopping, pausing and listening to the body, right? So one of the socializations is that we operate as if we're a bunch of minds walking around without bodies. And we try to, we schedule our lives that way. Like I was guilty of this, <laughs> you know, I look back now at the schedule I had pre-pandemic <laughs> and I was like, oh, I didn't leave my time myself any time as a body to move from place to place, but somehow I expected I would just be able to be, and I was just always late, always exhausted, always tired. So one of the things I feel like I really learned to do, and I do it first thing when I wake up in the morning before I move out of bed with my eyes closed, it's that first ritual is how is my body? How am I waking up today? And just like scanning through, seeing if there's any places that feel tense, taut, energized, you're still in dreamland. Let's make sure everything got back over here into the realm of the physical. Um, and several times throughout the day, and you know, right now I'm in a dance with sugar. So like when I'm like, I want chocolate, you know, then I'll like pause and be like, okay, what's happening? Is there a body need for chocolate or is it an emotional need for chocolate? Which doesn't mean I'll deny it, but I want to be in touch with what's actually happening. So that first first piece is to come to your own body and return to your body multiple times throughout the day. Um, because the body is a feeling machine. It's an emotional machine and it's balancing so much. 
and it's probably screaming at you <laughs> um, because you're not listening. So, you know, if you have chronic issues that happen, chronic pains that consistently come up, migraines, headaches, things like that, you know, I find many of us, we run to doctor, 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 fix this. And the thing that would actually fix it is listening to the body, particularly the limitations, right? Your body probably needs to move a little slower than you're moving, probably needs more breath, probably needs more emotion, probably needs more water. <laughs> so there's things like right now you can all take a drink of water, right? Just like be good to your body. Um, that's the first ritual. Once you start to tune into your body that way, it naturally occurs to you to start tuning into the bodies around you. Mm -hmm. So it's very rare for me now to see someone and not be like, how are you? And I mean, how is your body? And to notice if there's a look, I'm like, oh, you're tilting. What's going on? Are you, you know, there's something that's different in your body and I'm tuned into it. And everybody gets to speak for themselves, right? This is also releasing the normativity culture we have around what a body should be or do and asking each other, how is your body? What does your body need? How is my body? What does it mean? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. The, the, the physical body is something that is, you know, like you said, we sometimes are separated from it and encouraged to be separated from it, right? Yes. Um, because the body keeps count and it tells us um, what's, what's going on. And so for um, a lot of the, um, those emotions that come up, we are more in tune to emotions, but the physical part is a harder thing for us to um, engage. Yeah. And so, and, but there was a, a question that is rising to the top um, and it is about um, more emotion um, and uh -huh. I want to um, bring that to the space um, so many of us begin to be activated by anger or shock mm. how do we intentionally make the shift from the space of constructive anger to constructive pleasure Oh, I love that. <laughs> a lot of people loved it. Amazing. I love that question. I mean, first of all, a lot of us already know part of how to do this. We call it makeup sex, <laughs> right? It's like, you already know, you're like, we're mad and we can't figure it out, but we're going to fuck it out. We're going to figure it out that way, right? A lot of us already know there's something about intensity that can move into the body and become something that we can harness for pleasure. But because we don't talk about it, sometimes it can also become a toxic pattern or a pattern of not processing emotion. Um, something that I have found is it really helps me to actually release the anger physically. And I was definitely raised to not do that while simultaneously raised to receive that. So if any of you were spanked or hit as kids, we were told to be quiet and to repress our own anger, but then to be the physical recipients for our, the parental anger or the adult anger around us. And so what was left was this tight kind of container where it's like, we don't know what to do with the anger. You're either lashing out or you're bottling it in, neither of which actually works. So, you know, it, this has been really hard for me. <laughs> this has been really hard for me because I'm like, I'm supposed to be happy and hopeful all the time, but I'm so fucking angry. <laughs> I'm so angry, right? And it helps to have brilliant ancestors who've reminded us like James Baldwin, like if you're paying attention and you're feeling rage, like it helped, you know, that's, um, that's the idea, not the actual quote. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, understand that I'm like, this is the right response. The anger that you're feeling is the right response right? So it needs an embodiment. There's a somatic exercise that we do where you just literally hit a pillow with a stick. <laughs> you know, you just bring the stick up overhead and bring it down on the pillow. And if you need to visualize things, you can, but mostly it's just about actually directing that energy out of you. Um, that's one of the exercises I'll do. Uh, another is earthing, going out, finding a place where I can put my feet on the earth directly and standing there, letting the anger come into my body. But really, I always find that I can feel the earth able to hold it, right? So there's things like that. The practice is like that, that instead of repressing the anger, they invite the anger to come and be processed and moved through. And then it's not sitting there. What often happens, and you know this, the anger is attending to something else, right? The anger is protecting the part that is really hurt a broken heart, a vulnerable place. You see people going through divorce and they're just like, ah, you know, and it's like, you're angry because this person broke your heart and they're not who you thought they were gonna be. 
right? And the anger is trying to do something. As soon as we can respect that the anger is up to something, we can let it move. We can see what's under there. We can work it. Um, it's not like a straight pivot, right? It's not like you're like, I'm angry and now I figured out how to be pleasurable, you know? But I will say <laughs> that I have called friends and been like, oh my God, I just expressed my anger in real time and it felt great, right? And I didn't do harm with it. And I think that's the other piece that feels really important is when we repress anger and then it lashes out, we often do harm. We say things we know we shouldn't have said. We do things that are nefarious and, and like shady. And a lot of that plays out online. So then it's like a mark <laughs> that we have to walk with. Um, I find that it helps so much to be able to express my anger in myself or with therapeutic support or with my friends, really express it and then find out what's at the root. That's that Angela Davis radical going to the root. What's at the root? And does it need anything from anyone else? That's where the pleasure starts to happen for me is that when I'm angry, if there's something I need from someone else, I need to say that, right? If I'm angry with my beloved partner, then I need to be like, I really need this from you. And then my partner has sovereignty to actually respond to that need rather than just trying to tiptoe around my mysterious anger and figure out what to do, <laughs> right? And when I make a direct request, that, that then I stop moving in that resentment, anger cycle, whatever that is. I see us at a collective level doing that, right? That's what Black Lives Matter is. That's what Me Too is. That's what Occupy is, is we are collectively enraged about this and we are making a direct request, right? You're gonna understand this. And it's really powerful to see the anger harnessed and applied in that way, right? So then I think the pleasure comes from being able to feel that full range of emotion, be able to set the clear boundaries, make the clear request. Um, then you can start to move in different ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, are there any things that people should be looking out for um, when it's happening? Because I imagine that this is a this is a new experience, right? So we yeah. talk about physical and emotional, and when we are opening up, we yes. should also expect that there are going to be. Yeah. Well, I things. find what helps you know what helps me is to have partnership. You know, I talk about my woes. I talk about my goddesses, my partner, like I have partners who are up for the task. And the way I know that is because I'm radically honest with them. So I think the things you should look out for, one is any instinct to lie or to shrink or to, you know, to, to tuck your need in, um, that's not your friend. <laughs> like if you consistently feel like you cannot bring yourself to the relationship, whatever it is, work, life, whatever it is, that's not necessarily the person who can hold it. So you need good partners. And I always say, look for that. And then you also might not recognize yourself at least the first year or so of this practice. I know for me, like the anger would come through like, what is that? Like, I am a controlled Virgo who is happy. <laughs> and I had to be like, no, but I'm also like this person who's not in control of anything. And who's really upset and sad and angry that life is moving the way it is. And that there's so much that I can't intervene on. Um, I'll say something that helps, a few things that help. One is to normalize it, that this is a shocking, enraging time to be alive as a human being. And my friend, Angel Kyoto Williams um, is a black Buddhist Dharma teacher. And one of the things that she reminds me is that we have developed all this technology to be in touch with everything in the world, everyone in the world and know everything that's happening, but we have not developed the spiritual technology to actually be able to hold all that we now know. And for whatever reason, <laughs> every time I remember that, it really helps because I'm like, oh, of course, this is so overwhelming. This is so big, this is so massive. And I know all of it, I know more than, any human before me in history has known about everything that's happening in the world concurrently. And it's not just me knowing, everyone who wants to know is knowing. <laughs> so there's all this emotion that we don't actually know how to handle yet. And that's our work. Our work is to figure out how do we become grounding rods for this energy. And if you want, um, Angel, I'm trying to see if I have the book right here. Yes. 
Angel Kyoto Williams wrote this incredible book called Being Black that is, I think, a really beautiful piece of work. Um, and she also wrote a book with Lama Rod Owens um, about Black Buddhism. I can't remember the name of it right now, but I'll try to remember it before the end of the talk. But I also, I mean, since we're dancing all around it, mindfulness as a practice is really, really helpful. When you're noticing things, what you make of what you're noticing comes from how conscious you are. So if you're not very conscious and you start noticing things, you might feel really thrown off or you might feel really self-judging. If you're practicing, practicing compassion, practicing mindfulness, when you notice your anger come up, you can look at it and be like, ah, oh, my anger, that's a part of me. That's a beloved part of me. That anger has protected me. I know as a survivor that my anger is a part of how I made it to here to age 43. I wouldn't have made it if I hadn't had some anger, some protective boundaries, some mess. All of it is a part of me and I love all of it. Um, but that's the thing to notice. If there's any part of you that's coming up like that part of me is unacceptable, right? The, the part of me that gets shocked, that dissociates, that goes numb, that wants to just play video games and get high. That part of me is bad. It's like, no, that part of you is human. Yeah. And being a human, the more conscious you can become as a human being, that's the work. I think that's the main thing we're here to do is become conscious, be able to find pleasure inside of that consciousness, be able to find love and authentic connection inside of it. And those connections have to be able to hold anger, able to hold conflict, able to hold difference. This is another thing, and I know it goes into the emergent strategy territory, but the, the anger oh. and the, the conflict, you know, all that stuff is how we know we are different beings. And that is our diversity, our biodiversity. And that biodiversity is how we get the healthiest landscape, the healthiest ecosystem, if we can harness it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we keep trying to monoculture ourselves, <laughs> monocrop our humanity. It doesn't work right? Uh, because we actually can feel that divergence pushing up, pushing through, and, and it bursts through. We have age of Aquarius. We have times when it bursts through and everyone's like, we're all queer. We're all something, you know, it's, it's it bursts through because that, dis, that human need, that biodivergence is, that's how we stay healthy, right? Your anger is also part of a healthy ecosystem. And when you see it that way, it becomes easier to work with. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, and as we think about kind of those individual spaces, um, as you mentioned, um, that we are interconnected. Um, oh, it's Radical so Dharma. Sorry, <laughs> the book, the other book by Amy yes. is Radical Dharma. Um, okay. Talking Sorry. Race, Love, and Liberation. It looks like one of the professors yes. uh, put it in as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, in the chat. Okay, <laughs> good. In the chat. No, fantastic. Radical Dharma. All right. Um, yeah, so thinking about... Um, I'm going to merge two questions that I think kind of okay. go together um, when we are engaged in this kind of work. So Sherry Hunter puts out this question of how do you make a direct request of those who do not love you? Mm. So there's yeah. that question. <laughs> so we can hold that. Um, uh -huh. I want to merge that with the question from Erica that um, has become very popular in the Q&A. Okay. Um, as we think about being black and brown, future social workers that are in this space, um, what guidance do you have um, for that intersectional um, BIPOC beings who are navigating the colonization of institutional education in a historically racist field? Yes. Um, and so, and how does that lens of um, practicing pleasure activism mm. remain sacred in a space like that? So I think Ooh. those go together. Like if they don't love you or value or honor those principles, how that's are you right. supposed to show up and still keep those practices sacred? That's right. Oh, that's good. Thank you to both question askers. Um, hmm. <laughs> I mean, the first thing I always want to say is like create your own spaces, create your own, you know, I, I think of them for myself as maroon spaces, right? Maroon spaces were during slave era, uh, enslavement time. It was when, when black people would run away and find places where they could um, nourish each other and nourish themselves and survive outside of the structure of white sociopathy known as, as slavery, right? And 
we can't necessarily, we don't necessarily need maroon space to exist, but you need some space where you can go and let down the guard that you might have to wear through um, institutions that don't love you, right? So one is to find your crew, your circle, your group thread, right? I always say community is always the answer. So it's finding what is the community where you can be yourself and then grow more room for yourself. Um, all of these institutions are temporary. They feel permanent. They feel like they can never change. They are constantly changing. God has changed. This will change too. And so I think there's, once you come find your people, even if it's one other person, find your people and begin thinking, how do we change this institution? What can we change about this institution? Or if this institution can't change, how long do we stay here until we have enough mm, all the stuff we need in order to go do our own thing, right? Because the answer might be that. And I will say I've, I've been a part of that in many movement spaces where we were like trying to work in a white institution and change it from the bottom up and then realize all of our labor was going towards the effort of changing whiteness rather than the effort of serving community. And what we wanna be able to do is focus on serving community. So where I see white folks who are organizing themselves and getting radicalized showing up beautifully is when they're able to make that pivot to, oh, we shouldn't be making this whole institution about our changing, right? That's something we need to go and do our work around. We should be making this institution about how we actually support and center those black and brown voices, those black and brown needs. And those two moves together, right? When black people, brown people, BIPOC folks, indivi in, indigenous folks, are coming together in community and getting really clear on like, what is it that we need in order to best serve our community? Like, how do we do that? And then white folks who actually want to stay relevant in the work are like, yeah, so how do we center that? And how do we be in right relationship to that? What is the reparations of attention, the reparations of, of um, not just the financial stuff, although that's important, but the reparations of time and attention, then you can actually start to see something shift in those spaces. Now that piece around those who don't love you, and how you make requests of them, um, you know, first you make it a, a direct and clear, right? Direct and clear, like this is what we want and need. And people don't have to love you in order to be able to do that. You know, think about getting your car washed, right? Um, yeah, do the rims, right? It's fine, it can happen. What you have to pay attention to though, is if you can have integrity, if the person is actually doing what they said, you know, or if they say no, what is your next action? One of the things I do is I don't put the vulnerability, I don't put my vulnerability into the hands of those who don't love me, right? So I might do the vulnerable work with other people and then make the request, <laughs> you know, um, whether it's more resources or whatever. And I don't keep knocking on a door. So if, if the answer is no, I let it be a no and I move towards the yes, right? even if I'm creating the yes, yeah? Um, I think a lot of times we can, I don't wanna say waste time because I, I don't think that's how life works. I think it's all learning, but I think a lot of times we can spend learning and learning and learning the same lesson over again, trying to knock at a door that already exists and figuring out how do we get this door to open? And it's like, actually go build a bunch of community and then pff, you'll knock the door over <laughs> or, what my secret magic sauce is, is actually going and doing it my own way and then making it so compelling that the people come out the house like what's over there, <laughs> right? And I think that that has been Black people's survival strategy forever, ever, right? There's a reason why Black culture is the center of culture around the globe, <laughs> right? And like, I've never traveled someplace where people didn't love Tupac. Like there's a reason for that. There's something compelling that has come out of that pressure, right? There's a diamond level culture <laughs> that comes out of the pressure. Um, and I think that's true for many of us. So it's, that's the other answer. It's like, make the request, hear the answer. If it's not what you need it to be, go make something that's more compelling than that door. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes me think of, um... Tony K. Bambara, um, and you have that in your in the intro of this, right? Make the revolution irresistible. So, mm -hmm. you know, in thinking of that, you know, as scholars, parents, teachers, social workers, yeah. um, you know, Tony K. Bambara talks about the role of the artist is to um, 
make the revolution irresistible. That's the yeah. quote we're talking about. Um, so in all of our various roles, how might we make this revolution toward pleasure irresistible? Mm. I mean, I think one of the things that is irresistible is people who are doing their own work. I think you can really feel it when, um, and now I, I, you know, you can kind of feel my like shade towards the online realm, but like, I think you can really feel it when people are like online talking about the work <laughs> versus offline doing the work and then maybe coming online to like report back on that or, you know, connect in other ways. I find it when I meet someone like person to person, I can really feel if they can be present with me. And that's one of the first things I learned as an organizer was that the difference of what was gonna be able to be possible in a community was based on how present or not present I was. If I was present, then I could actually hear what was needed, not what I'd come in and decided was needed, but what was actually needed, right? If I was really present, I would notice that there was something happening under the surface that was unspoken. And one of the things that is irresistible for people is being truly heard. Another thing that's irresistible to people is being truly felt and feeling like, oh, what I feel matters, um, especially when people are younger, you know, when they're still like learning how the world works. We all remember the teacher or guidance counselor, or social worker, or person who was able to be like, I see that you're hurting, or I see that you are special and no one's noticing that. I see that you're really smart and you're getting left behind. I see you, right? I, I can, I, I hear you, what do you need? Um, I think that's really compelling. I also think unleashing your creative side, um, bringing your creative side into whatever else you're doing. If you are a poet who's also a social worker, right? Then how can you bring poetry into what you're doing and bring your favorite poets into the rooms where you're supporting people? Um, if you're a musician, you know, like make a song out of it. Like I'm a singer and when I was facilitating, <laughs> even if this is the only way I got to sing for, you know, years sometimes, I would call people back from small groups with singing. And I'd just be like, okay. And I'd just be like, all right, that was it. You know, but I got to bring that creative side. And people were like, I love that. <laughs> I love that. It's better than someone just yelling at me to come back. So finding the ways to bring the creative into, uh, into every space that you're in. And orgasmic wisdom, don't fake it right? Don't fake it. Don't fake being hopeful. Don't fake that you know things you don't know. Um, you know, don't fake that you're going to figure it all out or don't fake that something's going to be okay when it's not. Like, don't lie. You know, the more honest you are um, about where you are, what you're feeling, what you know, the more trustworthy you can be in the relationships of transforming the world. And you have to do your work on yourself. You have to be, my, my mentor, Grace Lee Boggs said, we transform our, ourselves to transform the world. So it's like, uh, you can't fake transforming yourself. <laughs> you can't, it shows, right? And if you try to, you know, eventually it hits out of returns and you'll be like, just kidding, <laughs> do it again. <laughs> so yeah, just life will catch you up if you try to fake it too far, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one of the um, questions that are coming up is a response to your idea about um, shadow pleasure. Oh, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, shadow pleasure also tells us to fake it, right? <laughs> yep. And um, so one of the questions is, can you help us imagine what it might look like to set a boundary with someone within our organization or our daily work that is protective but loving? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things, one thing first that helps if you're in a space where people are working together in a regular way is to talk about justice. Like one of the first things is to actually have a conversation around what are the ideas that we have around justice, right? Because most of the time people are operating within a punitive justice model without having articulated or committed to that, but just because that's the water we're swimming in, offering to them there's a restorative justice model offering that there's a transformative justice model and that there are distinctions, but a lot of it is we believe that we can get ourselves back to our humanity. Um, 
first of all, seeing if you can make a commitment to that. Boundaries really have a different tone inside of that perspective, right? That instead of just making a mistake and then getting punished for it, you start to be proactive and make requests, make boundaries and, and have those be served. So that would be the first piece is sort of talking about the overarching culture of the space. And even if everyone doesn't agree with you, being coming out as, well, I'm interested in restorative justice and transformative justice, which means that I'm really gonna be working to be non-punitive with all of you. And that's what I'm gonna ask for from you. And that also includes trying to be really clear about my boundaries because I don't wanna get triggered or build up a resentment or any of those kind of things. Like I wanna be in a, in a good relationship. Another thing that helps is a quote from my, my beloved friend, Prentice Hemphill, which is boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and myself simultaneously. Boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and myself simultaneously. You may not say that to the person, <laughs> especially if you're like, the distance is three states. <laughs> you know, if it's like a big distance that you need to love them, you might not say that, but if you're holding that in your heart and it's like, I'm looking for a way to love you, right? I'm looking for a way to be loving with you. That can show up and then be clear on the boundary. Don't be wishy-washy. Sometimes people will say a boundary without actually asking it, right? They'll just be like, it really like upsets me when you come in and you're just playing your music. That's a statement. <laughs> That's a statement. My music is awesome. I don't know what you're talking about, right? Um, as opposed to, uh, when I'm writing, I need things to be fairly quiet. And I would love to ask you if you could have your music on headphones um, or just not playing, you know, while I'm in here working, right? Then the person can say yes or no. And they might say no with a little resentment or a feeling, right? Because we have shame. They're like, oh, that means you've been sitting here with my music playing, feeling feelings. Right? And that's true, right? And then you go through that little clunk. But what I have found is if you can handle the discomfort of it, um, and it's not easy. Like I was trained not to do that, to never make anyone else uncomfortable, to always appease and figure it out. I should handle it. I should be the one who makes the sacrifice. <laughs> so when I, when I was first setting boundaries, this is me setting my first boundaries. <laughs> Could you, um, stop rubbing on my neck all the time. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's so, I mean, like, I love how you rub on my neck. Obviously it's the best neck rub, but I just don't want that. Confusing, right? Wasn't clear. I was like, this is making me uncomfortable. It's not professional. I don't want you touching my neck, right? It took years for me to actually learn to be like, I'd rather not have any touch right now, right? That's my boundary, right? So really, Learn, knowing that you're not going to go overnight from being someone who doesn't have a good way of setting boundaries to someone who does, you have to be in the practice. And again, this is where from emergent strategy, but that idea of what you practice, what you iterate, what you iterate, what you iterate, that's what you become. So if you're practicing not having boundaries, right, that's what you are. And then it's awkward. But one of the things that always gives me so much compassion because I love children so much watching children learn to walk, right? Where the first time they get themselves up and, you know, adults are like, oh, you're a genius, you're so amazing. You know, and then they fall down immediately. They're just like, oh, I'm up, I'm down. And imagine if they were like, well, I fell down. That's it. I'm not trying anymore, I'm gonna crawl. They don't do that. They're like, okay, that was try one of 3 billion and I'm gonna keep doing this. And then eventually I'm gonna hold on to something oh, now I can move, you know, it's so slow. And think of boundary work that way, right? Think of transformative justice work that way. Think of pleasure work that way. Like when I'm stressed, do I wanna go eat a pint of ice cream or do I wanna go have an orgasm, right? Like those different choices have wildly different impacts on my joints. <laughs> hint, hint, the orgasm one's better, right? So it's like, oh, how can I retrain my system to make different choices under pressure? right? That's when you start to have literally a new capacity. And, uh, and that's very compelling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very compelling. Thank you so much um, for being here for answering uh, many of our questions. Um, yeah. 
Um, this will, for everyone who is on the call, this will be recorded. So all of the books, all of the recommendations, all those oh, yeah. things will um, be available to you in recording in um, the coming days. Um, but I do want to have a final question. It's my signature okay. question. Okay. Um, what are you reading? Ooh, well, let's see. I think I have, I'm, I'm, I always read multiple books at a time. So I'm going to tell you everything I'm reading right now. Um, my nibblings which is a gender neutral term to refer to the children of your sibling. My nibblings put me onto this series of like young adult books. They're kind of hunger gamesy. So I just finished the first one, which was called The Red Queen. And then this is Glass Sword, which is the second one. So I'm reading that. I'm reading this book by Larry Yang called Awakening Together. So I'm in the beginning of my journey, my, my study of Buddhism, you know, I've been like dancing around it for years. And then I am reading um, on audiobook, How Long Till Black Future Month by N.K. Jemisin, which is a collection of short stories um, that are brilliant. Um, and then there's one other one on here. Oh yeah, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments by Saidia Hartman. So, those are my current, I think that's all the stuff I'm reading right now. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, everyone, this was fantastic. Thank you all for being here. Um, we do have a um, couple of announcements, um, but I would, before we get into that, if we can give Adrian some air claps. <laughs> um, I know that we're on a webinar, um, but we, I do see um, the chat going wild. So um, we appreciate you and we appreciate you being there. I was like, I can never have it open while I'm doing stuff. <laughs> I know it is just, it runs. So definitely oh. open that up and see all of the, um, great things wow y'all been playing. going off <laughs> thank you oh thank y'all deep gratitude to you thank you for listening with such an open heart oh yes spirit drums okay i love that wow thank y'all thank you so much for being here with us mm -hmm. um and so we want you all to um save the date for our next Catalyst series um, as we um, present um, Kelly Fajardo Asteen um, on January 27th of 2022. Can you believe that? 2022 um, at 4 p.m. Um, now I'm like, we are in the future. Okay? We are in the future. <laughs> in the future. We gotta keep going, but yeah. Um, and this interactive event will be in person um, on the University of Denver's campus. Um, Callie will touch on her book, Sabrina and Karina, and exploring how storytelling is a way to retain history through social justice. Um, Callie's magnetic story collection breathes life into her Latino characteristics of indigenous ancestry and the land that inhabit, they inhabit in the American West against the remarkable backdrop of Denver, Colorado a place, ah, uh, now that's perfect alignment. So if you all can see, um, Adrienne is holding up her um, copy of Sabrina and Karina. Um, and it's a place that is fierce and is exquisite. Um, these women navigate the land the way they navigate their lives with caution, grace, and quiet force. Um, so the link is in the chat and um, we um, hope to um, see you all. Um, in January for our next um, iteration. Thank you so much.